Yo, yo, good afternoon. Today we were, we we're going to be covering, today we're going to be covering um, the great American novel, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, the 1851 monumental piece of prose. So thank you everybody for joining me this afternoon. Um, I'm trying to do it a little bit earlier this afternoon. So hopefully the, the um, video quality will be a little better. Uh, it's a day off here. Everybody's got the day off holiday here. So of um, people using up the web, they'll probably do that. And so hopefully, um, if that's even how it works, really, the, the truth is we're just boomer teching it here. Oh, and all of a sudden, and right away when I say that, the video quality starts to fade. So, all right, we're going to do the best we can here, you guys. Um, and we're going to cover... Uh, again, we're covering uh, Herman um, Herman Melville's 1851 novel Moby Dick, and we're also going to be looking at. I linked some articles in the video description, um, and they're just they're just it's just some extra sources and sh some articles that I'm sort of incorporating into my analysis of the book. And we're also going to be looking at um, some of Harold Bloom, the the um, the uh, he's deceased. He's deceased now. Uh, but Harold Bloom's um, genius, which includes uh, some great work on Herman Melville, and Harold Bloom is the um, sort of the he's the or he was the great American critic, especially in terms of literature. I mean, he's uh, his body of work is huge. His actual body was huge. I think I told you guys that story of when I sat next to him at that poetry reading at in um, New York. Um, and so it makes sense that his favorite book of all time is Moby Dick um, because he himself was kind of this whale of American literature. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be looking at the novel. We're not going to be going through the entire novel in terms of a full explication of the entire novel because, you know, Moby Dick is almost a 500 page tome. Although I will say this, um, I I, I, you know, if you guys haven't read Moby Dick, it's totally understandable. Uh, many of you probably have, you know, you read it in American literature class, you read it in college, you read it in grad school. Um, you may even have your doctorate on in, in American literature um, or, in a, you know, in a specific area of American literature, or you may be a Melville specialist. However, um, I purposefully avoided this book. I avoided this book my whole life. I've talked about how I feel about fiction. I've read obviously a lot of, a lot of fiction and, um, and a lot of novels. I don't mean obviously. I mean I, because I love to read. Um, and uh, but I purposefully avoided Moby Dick because it's again, it's one of those books that is so ingrained in the American culture, in the American sort of you know Emersonian self reliance. Oh, these are the great works, canon uh, um, spirit that I sort of avoided Moby Dick. I read. Um, you know, of course, I, I had to analyze um, huge um, excerpts and passages uh, when I was in AP literature and then again in college, university and grad school. But um, I always avoided sitting down and reading Moby Dick like um, like I would you know normally read a novel until and I did that my whole life until um, let's see, I read this uh, May 24th, 2020. So that was um, when all of the quarantinqua was happening. And I went through, um, you remember all those days when like all of the things were shut down because of the things that were happening? Actually, that, I don't know if that had happened yet. That was after May 31st. But uh, when when we were, you know, when, when everything was shut down or whatever, um, I went through uh, my own library and I read, a, uh, I just started to read a bunch of books that had been in my library for a long time that I'd always avoided. I thought it was a great time for it. And um and uh, I went through my entire library. I did that. And then I, I watched all of the DVDs that I had and rewatched all of those. But anyway, to get back to Moby Dick, um, uh, today is a great day for analyzing Moby Dick uh, because it's a dark, stormy, um, cold again spring day. And I remember that the day that I read this book, uh, it was the same. I had a fire going and it was late May. And uh, and yes, you may be put off by this book, um, but but uh, it's not, it, I mean, it's a 500 page, um, you know, mega piece, but you can read this book in a day and you'd be surprised how, you know, the, the construction of the book Melville intended, like there's a reason that the book is set on the sea. And one of those is this sort of meta, this meta quality of the fact that you get, um, you get sort of sucked into um, 
uh, uh, what Jack Kerouac called the holy contour of life. But in terms of literature, it's like you get sucked into this contour of reading the book like a wave and it's hard to put down. And you feel like you've been on a sea journey when it's over, obviously. But um, it's it's I was uh, I was astounded by the book when I read it. I mean, I, you know, aside from all of the analysis that I've always that I'd already done leading up to that. But when I sat down and just read um, the entire novel, I was um, I mean, obviously, you're I was impressed. But that's sort of a that's almost a crass way of putting it. It is exactly what Harold Bloom says um, when he says that, you know, it's a it's a Shakespearean prose poem. Uh, it's really astonishing. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze specific passages in the book, um, dealing with, uh, the whale Leviathan and with, um, Ahab as the sort of Luciferian Gnostic anti-hero of the, of the novel. Uh, we're going to, we're going to skip all of the, you know, a, a lot of the whale uh, passages that deal so, sort of like with enumeration of, of whaling. Um, and we're going to skip uh, large swaths of the book um, that would are extraneous to our analysis today. And we're, we're simply going to stick with those specifically um, a, a few passages, a few chapters from the beginning of the book and mainly the last few chapters of the book, which is where captain Ahab really um, comes out. And, um, you know, you remember that scene in Fear and Loathing, right? I am Ahab. And he's got, he's got um, Dr. Gonzo in the, in the tub and he's got the, the shower rod. Um, Ahab is kind of like Dracula and kind of like Frankenstein in that, yes, they all, they all are, are written in the 19th century and they all sort of fit into this. Um, I mean, Moby Dick is not a gothic novel, but in many in many ways, it, it, it's a it's certainly a Byronic novel, and and it's amazing how uh, they have this Kurtzian quality of the uh, Kurtz from Conrad's um, Heart of Darkness. This this Kurtzian quality of not showing up until the latter parts of the novel. It's like they're they're this 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 figure that sort of comes out of the clouds and takes over and everybody's talked about them the whole book. And then finally they appear and they don't let anybody down. Um, and if you've read Dracula, if you've read Bram Stoker's Dracula, you, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. Like Dracula d does not appear in the novel that much. He's, he's like, he makes rare appearances, which of course goes um, towards the, the form and the content certainly meld in that book. And, you know, he becomes like a specter that haunts the book, but then finally appears at certain stages. And then, of course, we've done Frankenstein. Go to my Frankenstein analysis that we did that people, um, I, I think people seem to enjoy and that we sort of flipped the entire story on its head, which is, which, which again is, is appropriate for that book, considering all of the inverted aspects of the, of the narrative and the symbolism. And so what my, my thesis for Moby Dick and our analysis today is, is it's hard to um, come up with a new, I, I don't really have per se a new um, fresh take on Moby Dick other than, um, I mean, we're not going to go into the usual uh, uh, sort of normie analysis of the book, but we are going to talk about, I mean, it's what I was trying to say is it's, it's hard to come up with a fresh take because this book is, so monumental and it's been criticized, you know, it has so much criticism. There's such a body of work that the interpretations are, they abound right now. Th the same goes for Shakespeare. However, we did come up with some, um, we, I think I did have a unique um, thesis statement for Macbeth um, for paradise lost, but it, ironically, again, those two works tie into Moby Dick. So um, here's what I have to say about Moby Dick just from the outset. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about Ahab, Ishmael, and Leviathan. So um, Ahab, right? Captain Ahab. We know Ahab from the Book of Kings. Um, Ahab was the husband of Jezebel, right? Um, and he was a Baal worshiper, right? Ishmael is the son of Abraham. Um, I just made some brief notes here. Um, Abraham, uh, Ishmael is the son of Abraham from Genesis. And... Leviathan, of course, appears in the book of Job, Isaiah, Psalms, and Revelation. Um, forgive me if I get anything wrong, you guys. Obviously, you know, I'm in a high IQ company here, and um, 
And there's a couple of things we're going to touch on as far as Gnosticism in the book and origin, right? And uh, of course, if you want a complete analysis of of anything in that area, then go, please go to, of course, obviously, uh, Jay's Analysis, um, Church of the Eternal Logos, our buddy David Patrick Harry, um, who have both covered those in detail. Go to go to Father Deacon Ananias, right, at Patristic Faith on, on YouTube. Um, and hey, while you're at it, Go and watch Jerry stream our our main homeboy um, Jerry and his stream last night. His great interview with um, David Patrick Harry, DPH Cotel Church of the Eternal Logos at Exposing Powerful Lies live streams. It was an amazing interview. Um, I always get so much from those guys, and it was it was brilliant, good, really wonderful to listen to. So please go watch that. Go see all of our other homies um, before I before I keep going. Um, check out our course, our homegirl. Rachel Wilson, based homeschool mom, and buy her book. Buy her book on occult feminism. Buy Jay's books. Um, check out David Patrick Harry's uh, academic work. Check out his um, check out his work on his website. Check out Primal Edge Health. Tristan, um, sub to all of our friends. We have a great group of uh, friends here, and I'm just happy to be here. I'm um, trying to contribute my own little corner uh, talking about literature. So. Um, some some things about Ahab before we keep going. I know I'm babbling on. I'm going to get to it in a second, guys. Uh, Ahab. Ahab is sort of defies a single definition um, or a single analysis because he's so large of a character. And the book is so large that it fits into we, we can sort of analyze him in a number of different ways. Um, I would say that he is the Miltonian Paradise Lost Satan. He's that is that is him. If anything, Ahab is the Miltonian Satan for sure. He is a Gnostic Lucifer. He is the Paradise Lost Satan. Um, he's also a Shakespearean Macbeth and King Lear and a Prospero figure. Nobody really mentions Prospero in terms of their analysis, but but Ahab has all these qualities of like he's he's a wizard. He's a, he's almost a sorcerer, especially in the scene. Um, in the book where you guys, if you read it, you remember where um, lightning strikes the mast, right? And St. Elmo's fire, the, the green vaporous fl um, flames sort of go over to his new, um, his new harpoon and he lifts it into the air and it's like a lightning rod or he's like a, he's like a Prometheus. He's remember we talked about Frankenstein and sort of in terms of the Prometheus or Satan figure, but Ahab is so much of that. Um, he is, uh, an Emersonian um, transcendental 19th century man. And um, he's sort of everything that Emerson, he embodies all of Emerson's transcendentalist ideas. We did our own stream on Emerson um, early on when we started the channel. Check that out. If you haven't seen that, of course we flipped that one on its head too. Um, and uh, he's a, he's certainly a Byronic hero. He is a Brontean um, Heathcliff figure. Um, which nobody, I've, I, I haven't really read much about a comparison between those two figures, but he is certainly a Heathcliff figure. Um, he is a, he's like a quasi sorcerer. He's a, he's like a Merlin um, on the, uh, he's like a, a seagoing Merlin in, in his own quest um, for, remember that Merlin in the Arthurian legend, remember Merlin um, uh, hit, you know, push the dragon down under the castle for Uther Pendragon, right? Arthur's father before he, um, before he uh, puts Excalibur into the stone and sort of, and, and then that later deals with the prophecy of like the dragon rising again. That's why the Welsh flag has a, has the dragon on it. Um, and, and he's, this is like Ahab, right? With the sea serpent, the sea dragon. Um, like we said, he's a Gnostic Lucifer. Um, Let's see. Uh, dealing with the the Leviathan, the, we can we're going to talk about the anal uh, we're going to analyze the symbolism of the Leviathan of the white whale, right? Why is he a white whale? What does he mean? Um, remember, uh, Aquinas talked about the Leviathan um, is the demon of envy, um, and even in Levian, I don't know if you guys knew this, but in Levian Satanism. Uh, fucking perverts. In Levian Satanism, they have, excuse my language, folks, excuse my language. I'm trying to make this appropriate. It's the afternoon. But in Levian Satanism, you know, in the sigil, the Baphomet sigil, right, um, with the the pentagram, 
do you know that they have the Hebrew letters uh, for each of on the outside of this of the sigil, right? For each of the five points of the pentagram. And did you know that that symbolizes Leviathan? Um, let's see. Also, um, let's see. In yeah, in Gnosticism, um, origin, right? Jay's talked a lot about origin. Um, origin. Um, uh, scolded a bunch of people. Remember, it was at the the Ophites for worshiping a sa- uh, a Leviathan, a serpent. Um, the serpent stand, um, the, the, the whale, the whale is like the serpent here. The whale is like, um, also stands, the Leviathan is like a, like an Ouroboros figure encircling the world. Um, Gnostics think of it like the Archon, the Archon that encircles the world. Um, and then we also have ties in with like, um, Gustav Torre, right? The engraver who did like, if you want to see depictions of Moby Dick, go to the engravings by Torre, go to... Um, William Blake's engravings. Um, and the, the story is certainly Blakean and Gnostic. And um, again, just like Frankenstein, it has it, oh, it, it has basically it owes an homage to Coleridge and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Of course, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner plays a much more prominent role in this in terms of its uh, literal events and its literal interpretation. Um, so yeah, before I get going with... Um, Harold Bloom and talking about Harold Bloom, um, who is, by the way, Harold Bloom is literally a Gnostic. He's literally a Kabbalah Gnostic. And we're going to discuss his interpretations of Moby Dick, especially in that light. Now, of course, I don't agree with their world, with his worldview. I don't agree with, um, with the worldview in Moby Dick in terms of its Gnostic symbolism. And it's um, it's quest, but I do what, but I do think it's important to read the interpretation from Harold Bloom of the book, considering that the two things match, right? Harold Bloom's worldview and Moby Dick, um, in terms of its, um, in terms of the figurative interpretation and an analysis of Moby Dick, and certainly I think we could probably say what Melville intended. I mean, this the story is. If anything, it, again, it is a Gnostic quest. Ahab is a Luciferian figure rebelling against um, a demiurge, right? Now, again, I don't agree with that as a worldview, but I'm saying, just to make sure, right, I'm just saying that it is important, though, to read the literature um, discussing that. And there's no better source, if that's the case, than Harold Bloom, because he is literally that. He's also um, the, I mean, there are, there are a lot of important um important American critics, but I can't think of anybody who is, is more significant than Harold Bloom, especially in the history of American, of, of American literature. So let's get going. And before I say any more, uh, thank you to all my homeboys in the chat, especially thank you to, um, Jeff and to Jerry exposing powerful lies, live streams and to TV, TGF <coughs> to Natesky, to all my homies for um, dropping those links for me, please um, consider supporting me. And again, um, thank you uh, for supporting me um, so much the other night. Thank you to Base Homeschool Mom, who really, um, really made my night and um, was so sweet and so kind about my last stream um, on The Great Gatsby. And I really appreciate that because uh, Rachel Wilson is a is an important writer an important um, thinker, and I think that we are um, really blessed to know her. So coming from her, that's really, really, that's really high praise, and I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, shout out to Moon. Shout out to Eliana, beautiful Eliana, and thank you to everybody who's been supporting me. And so please um, think about continuing to do that if you're watching this, especially if you're watching this later. I really appreciate it. So with that being said, let's get to Harold Bloom. And um, his book, Genius, I read this in 2015, and I'm going to start here with, you guys are going to love this. I, I'm going to start here with the introduction, and the, the, the preface is written by Harold Bloom, and it's called On the Book's Arrangement, Genius and Kabbalah. <laughs> this guy, literally, the book is basically about his, his in, um, picks for the greatest writers um, in Western literature. He includes some, some Eastern literature as well, but he puts them in categories of the uh, 10 points of the Sephiroth, right? From, uh, 
from Kether to Malkut. And I, I only know those, those terms, well, from reading, but also from the Station to Station song by David Bowie. You remember? From Kether to Malkut. Remember, the song is a Kabbalah song. Go back and listen to David Bowie's um, Station to Station. It is a dark track, and it's literally um, – a Masonic Kabbalah song. So go back and listen to that if you haven't heard it. So I'm going to read the um, some of the preface here um, from Harold Bloom, and then I'm going to read his uh, passage on Melville because we we could just read that, and that would probably be enough an inter- of an in- interpretation of Melville, but I'm going to get to the actual text in a minute. So he says, Genius and Kabbalah, I have juxtaposed these 100 geniuses of language in 10 sets of 10 each and then divided the sets into subsets of five. All genius in my judgment is idiosyncratic and grandly arbitrary and ultimately stands alone. The contemporary of Dante could have precise, could have had precisely his relation to tradition, his exact learning and something like his love for quite another Beatrice, but only Dante wrote the Commedia. Each of my hundred is unique, but this book requires some ordering or grouping as any book does. I have arranged it as a mosaic, believing that significant contrasts and illuminations emerge. Illuminate, confirm. Um, Let's see. So he goes on to talk about where he puts Melville in in this, and this is in something called um, Hesed, he says, which is in Kabbalah. See, we're getting, we are learning something now about Kabbalah and the, and the Sephiroth now, right? In terms of this illuminate shit. Um, the bountiful covenant love that issues from God or from women and men, I found an initial, initial set of representatives in five great ironic writers, really ironists of love. John Donne, Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, and gentler in their mastery of ironic longing, Jane Austen, and L- Lady Morisaki. Second grouping are also geniuses of Eros, but deal more with the anguish of covenant. Uh, Hawthorne and Melville, the Bronte sisters and Virginia Woolf. Well, that's interesting because uh, I just linked Melville and Bronte with, um, with um, uh, Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. And I haven't, I guess I, that seeped into my consciousness from 2015 reading this. Um, Cause I haven't really gone back. So let's get to, let me find his passage on how he groups him. And this is, let's see, he says, images of isolation, of madness, and of lost love uh, ally these very different novelists. Hawthorne's Hester, Melville's Ishmael, Charlotte Bronte's Mad Woman in the Attic, Rochester's first wife, right, in um, uh, is it Jane Eyre, Heathcliff, and Virginia Woolf's Septimus Smith, whose suicide prefigures Woolf's own. Remember how Virginia Woolf did that, you guys committed S-U-I side. Um, she put on a pair of, she put on a pair of, uh, cin- concrete boots, right? Cinder block boots and walked there out into the ocean. What a freak. Um, are all figures of failed covenant. Is Ishmael the exception since he is saved by que- Queequeg's coffin? Partly, but Ishmael and Queequeg were involved in the covenant cut with Ahab to hunt down and slay the great white Leviathan, exalted by God in the book of Job as the authorized tyranny of nature over man, right? Scourge of God. Melville pro- professed himself a Gnostic. Mel- Here we go. Melville professed himself a Gnostic. He had um, in his possession, he had uh, Gnostic books in his library, which he had inscribed. He carried a book of um, uh, a book on um, uh, Gnostic. Uh, I don't know if it was the Gnostic, Gnostic gospels, but he carried um a book of like Gnostic interpretations of the Bible with him on his, on his sea journeys. Um, Hawthorne, let's see. um, uh, Hawthorne and Wuthering Heights and the final lyrics of Emily Bronte clearly possess Gnostic elements. Absolutely. Hawthorne's Hester is Emersonian, but Hawthorne Bronte, the profoundly aggressive in her art uh, also fought, uh, also fought through to her own sense of individuality. Virginia Woolf, a Paterian skeptic and an aesthete achieved an art so much her own as to make her a novelistic school of one. I hate Virginia Woolf. Sorry if you like Virginia Woolf, but I hate Virginia Woolf. Always hated her. Um, okay, so let's get to uh, Herman Melville. Here we go. Here we go. I'm gonna, just going to read some selections from, from Bloom's criticism and analysis of Melville himself. 
before we get to the actual text of the novel. Okay, so here we go. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard marks. Are but as pasteboard masks. Forgive, forgive me. Uh, masks, right? Persona, the mask, illusion versus reality. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its future, of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. That's Gnostic. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? It's just like Plato's cave. To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near me. Sometimes I think there's not beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me. He heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate and be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal. I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that? Then could I do the other? Since there is ever a, a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations, but not my master, man, is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth has no confines. Wow. Quote from, from Moby Dick right there. That's probably all we need to know to legitimize our own little mini thesis here of Ahab as the pure Luciferian Gnostic um, anti-hero, right? Whom we hate, but who is the protagonist of the novel who talks about, really, he's he's hunting, he specifically says there, he's hunt he's hunting, he's hunting Leviathan as either the Demiurge itself or as an agent of the Demiurge, right? That's his whole modus operandi. It says, Captain Ahab addresses his crew in the quarter deck, chapter 36 of Moby Dick, urging them to join in his Promethean quest to hunt down and destroy the white whale who has maimed him. Melville's Ahab speaks a Shakespearean prose, metaphysical and dramatic, that has been transformed by the author's genius into a permanent element in the American language. Strike through the mask is Ahab's directive to us. We are locked within the wall of the visible or natural universe, and Moby Dick is that wall shoved near to me. There may be nothing beyond the wall, but Ahab will not brood upon such a nihilism. Nothing beyond the wall, meaning that the Leviathan, like we said, is this like arc is like here interpreted as like an archon. We hear the voice of our instinctive American spirituality affirming itself against a nature it repudiates. What is best and oldest in Ahab cries out its American defiance. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. When Ahab adds, who's over me, then he rejects not the unknown God, but the tyranny of nature over man. It's not what he's saying. No, he's no, that's not what he's doing. I disagree with that. We do Ahab wrong, he being so majestical to offer him the show of violence, as many moralizing scholars continue to do. Ahab is no villain, not even a hero villain like Macbeth. More than our sympathy sympathies are with Ahab. We are Ahab. Now that's an interesting point. He tasks us, he heaps us, for he is the hero as American, our tragic Don Quixote, questing for ultimate justice over the last enemy, death. Uh, I think you're stretching it there, bud. I don't know about comparing Don Quixote to Ahab. That seems a little much, old Professor Bloom. Um, and we are Ahab. Well, we are not Ahab, but we are Ahab in the sense that we, the American consciousness, the American uh, Emersonian spirit, is supposed to identify with Ahab. Now, it's interesting because reading this book, I never. I, I never like put myself in the shoes of Ahab. Um, in in fact, you know, one of my like favorite things to do, um, and maybe this is like a dude thing to do, you guys. But I've always loved like adventure stories and disaster. I've I've always loved adventure stories, disaster movies, end of the world sort of you know dy dystopian movies and. And like war movies, war books, because it's natural for, you know, I always put myself in the place of what if I were there, what would I do? Right. Um, but with Moby Dick, you never really do that um, because it, it's sort of outside of that. Now, with Macbeth, we did that. And Macbeth is certainly the like we said in, in our Macbeth stream, go back and watch that. That was like our first I think that was our very first stream. Um, and in the Macbeth stream, uh, we talked about.
Macbeth is the anti, he's like a true anti-hero. He's, he's the protagonist of the play, but we don't, we, we shouldn't sympathize with him because of his megalomania, his villainy. Right. But we, but somehow we do, but in this one, I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Natsuki's got heavy snow. I'm lost in a hail of snow going out with me. Oh man. Natsuki. Dang. You guys, it, the worst of those, you know, spring, late, late spring snowstorms, right? You, we had a lull in the, uh, we had a lull in the weather and now all of a sudden we're hit with this, uh, vortex of snow. Of course, I'm only down here in, in Appalachistan. I'm not where, probably not where Natsuki is, but Natsuki, you are a, you are a hard man. You are, a, you are a, a true outdoorsman. You are an alpha of the wilderness and we know you will get through it, brother. Right. So here we go. Herman Melville. Um, uh, let's see. Captain Ahab is the American Prometheus and not the American Adam. Okay. A rugged spirit, both attracted and repelled by Emerson. Melville haunted Emerson's lectures and scribbled fierce marginalia in Emerson's essays. Now, interesting about Melville, we haven't really talked about Melville himself and who he was and where he came from. Well, he was a, I think he was a Quaker. Ahab is certainly a Quaker, but Melville was not. Uh, he was not a, um, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts um, elite like Emerson, part of the intelligentsia. He was also not really a self-made man. He was more of a true Byronic gentleman without means in his own life uh, because he came from a well-to-do family that sort of fell on hard times, lost their fortune, and he went whaling. And he he was on a ship for years. It, You know, I think people have a misconception of Melville as like, Oh, you know, he spent some time on a boat, so he wrote Moby Dick. No, he was on the boat for like 30 years. And, um, you know, including the Polynesia and, and got, you know, all these places. So this comes from a, a real, the story is, is genuine or true in that sense. Um, but he was also a learned man, obviously, because we have this book. But, you know, he, he, he called, he has that quote about, um, he called the, the ship's deck or the ship's quarters, um, his Harvard and Yale because Harvard and Yale would, would not have a person like him. Um, it says, this is page 307 of this book, by the way, if you ever get a copy of this, um, their affinities outweighed their differences and the proper answering voice to Moby Dick comes in Emerson's dark, the, uh, essay, the conduct of life. One might say that Melville reads Emerson rather as Ahab would seeking out the earliest Emerson, the Orphic adept who is a Gnostic, not an idealist. That's interesting. The Orphic adept, right? But Moby Dick is dedicated to the genius of Hawthorne, whom Melville loved. And the dedication implicitly declares, this is my genius. Ahab is my Hester, my vision of the heroic American. Um, Bloom calls um, Cormac McCarthy the inheritor to Melville. I would agree with that. Um, and he says... It is certainly the most extraordinary of such visions to date, outsoaring its strongest descendants, even McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Ahab is a hero villain like Macbeth and Hamlet, rather than a genius of villainy like Iago and Edmund and King Lear. And yet Ahab, again like Hamlet, is a genius. He is the genius or demon of his nation. The United States does not have a single national epic, but an amalgam of three very diverse works. Moby Dick, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, and Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Did I mention you guys before that? Um, do you know what the book was that got Bubba caught with um, Monica Lewinsky? Do you know what that book was? Do you remember that from the 90s if you were around? Or do you happen to know? And Think back into the halls of your memory, right? In, your, in the labyrinthine passages of your mind palace. Think about what the book was that got Bubba caught. And this is, I think it's pretty interesting that a work of literature supposedly is what produced the proof that the affair happened. Do you know what it was? It was Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Bill Clinton gave Monica Lewinsky a, I think it was a first edition copy of Leaves of Grass. Moon, I was born in 92, so I won't be much help here. I know I'm giving away my old, you know, I'm over 40, so I, ca I guess I count as a boomer now. Um, but yes, he gave her, um, it may have been a first edition copy of Leaves of Grass. I have, I actually have a, um, a 19th century edition of Leaves of Grass, but it's not a first edition. But yeah, and it was inscribed to Monica Lewinsky from Bill, right? 
Do you want to hear a boomer joke, you guys? It's actually more of a Gen X joke, I guess, but it's from the time. I remember hearing this back uh, when all that stuff happened. All right, so um, let me tell you uh, Let me tell you this joke. <laughs> Sorry. It's raining, but I still got the pollen seeped into my house or something. All right, so here's the joke. Uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton said, uh, I did, this is kind of crass. Okay, so forgive me. He said, uh, I did not tell that woman to lie in her deposition. I simply told her to lie there in that their position. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> now, forgive me, but I was like, I, I don't know. I was like 15 or something, right, when I heard that joke. And I still remember it. So, <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? All right. So, let's keep going here. Um, But the awesome Ahab rightly admired for his greatness by Ishmael and the common reader, joins Milton Satan and Shakespeare's Falstaff in alienating scholars, old style and new. W.H. Auden, as a Christian critic, disapproved of Ahab. His whole life, in fact, is one of taking up defiantly a cross he is not required to take up. One gathers that Ahab ought to have played Job, but as Stubb said, says, uh, Ahab's Ahab. Auden is uh, very temperate compared to a papist critics dismissal of the American captain. The world of his acts is strident, assertive, full of reputation and destruction. Is that not true of Hamlet, Lear, Othello, and Macbeth? Of course, those are the four Shakespearean tragedies. And yeah, that's probably true. Um, let's see. Ahab, like Melville, is not Ahab, like Melville, is not a Christian. And like William Blake, he believes that the God of this world, called by the names of Jesus and Jehovah, is a botching demiurge who has set Moby Dick to reign over us in the same way that Jehovah sends Leviathan and Behemoth against our poor, against poor Job. Walt Whitman says that the sunrise would kill him if he could not now and always send forth sunrise from himself. That's a Blakean image. But Ahab is even more American and vows that he would strike the sun if it insulted him. Uh, is he not then to strike through the mass that is Moby Dick? Ahab is the American as ungodly, godlike man. Indeed, he is with, with Emerson, Joseph Smith, William James, one of the founders of the American religion, our unacknowledged blend of Gnosticism, enthusiasm, and Orphism. That's probably true, right? Who knew, who knew that we'd probably agree in that sense on the worldview of the, Amer of the state of the uh, so-called American religion? With Harold Bloom, right? How many streams have we done? Right? How many have we done? How many streams have we watched? Right? From Jay, um, and from um, from DPH, where they talk about the sort of Gnost the base the inherent Gnosticism of like the American version of Christianity, right? Um. What is best and oldest in us is not part of the, and not, I'm not saying we agree, right? We don't want it to be that way, but that this is a statement on what, what is the paradigm in the country, right? What is best and oldest in us is not part of the creation, but goes back to the primal abyss, our foremother and forefather, the chorus that denounces Ahab when it does not neglect his Gnosticism, deplores it as an ancient heresy or as a romantic one. I've argued elsewhere uh, in his book, The American Religion, 1992, Harold Bloom, that from 1800 on, the United States has called itself Protestant while actually following one variant of Gnosis or another. In, in his neglected long poem of 1876, Clarell uh, Melville prophesied a crucial development in the American religion currently manifested in our Pentecostals, Pentecostals, Freer Baptists, and Black and Hispanic knowers. Uh, Twas averred that in old Gnostic pages blurred, Jehovah was construed to be author of evil. Yea, it's God, but, but Christ revered alone. Here from, less frank, none say Jehovah's, Jehovah's evil, none gainsay that he bears the rod. Scarce, uh, scarce that. But there's a dismission, civil, and Jesus is the indulgent God. Ahab, a century and a half ago, belongs to a wilder phase of the American religion and asked Jesus for no indulgences. Well, he probably fucking should have. Sorry, excuse my language. Right? He should he should have asked. He should right. Okay. Um currently 
Let's see. Um, currently not a Christian sentiment. It is the credo of a warrior in metaphysical cause. My subject being genius and Ahab, despite the critics being Melville's own demon. I seek to define Ahab's genius, which is spiritual like Emerson's or Joseph Smith's ferociously transcendental. Ahab blends Emerson and Thomas Carlyle in searching for a true apocalypse and not the path of revolution that always becomes reaction against. Scholars chide Ahab for taking his crew down with him, but who except the Christian Starbuck ever sees an Ahab, a captain back for Egypt? Yeah, Starbuck is one of the few, uh, few um, the Andes, he sees the three peaks and he, and he says um, that they represent the Trinity. Meanwhile, Ahab is this Lucifer character, right? Um, this is one of the permanent centers of American literature and of the national psyche. And I take it as a critique of Emerson's epiphanies of the transparent eyeball and the ruin or blank in his essay nature. Remember we read the essay uh, with the, I am, I'm one, I'm become all, I'm a transparent eyeball. Remember that? Um, the visionary blanks of Emily Dickinson and of Wallace Stevens are also crucial expressions of the American strain. Melville has almost always descends from Emerson but with a troubled sense of how close he remains to the Concord seer. If there could be a central sentence in the maelstrom of Moby Dick, it would be, though in many of its aspects, this visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. Ishmael, Spin Spinozistic pantheist or Neoplatonist, has joined Ahab's Gnosticism in his sense of those invisible spheres. Right? Um, let's see. And then one more part here, I'm going to read from this and then we'll go through some sections of the book that will, um, explicate this. I memorized this involuntarily when I was 12, um, and chant it frequently still, though now I love the interpolation stage direction best. He, he's talking about one of uh, Ahab's soliloquies in the book. Ahab stands confronting the fires as a personality. And if he worships, he does it in defiance. Though Shakespeare hovers in the rhetoric Hamlet is not far away. Uh, Melville's genius triumphs here in Ahab's rhapsodical intensity, which breaks novelistic bounds. But then Moby Dick, as befits its Shakespeareanism, is of no genre. Polonius, like, remember Polonius is the father of um, Ophelia. Um, let us call it a dramatic romance epic as appropriate for the age of Emerson as Leaves of Grass was to be five years later. Ahab's invocation of the corpusance is marked by his primal in, uh, ambivalences toward the spiritual realm. Once he had been a convert to Zoroastrianism, but now know thee, and the gnosis makes him free, he says in italics. Um, he confronts one version of genius, the fire's, the fire's fathering force with his own personality or demonic genius and mocks the fire for, it, for not knowing the foremother, the abyss of the Gnostics, the origin before the creation fall, right? Sophia. Um, and then finally, um, skipping a little bit here. Ahab suffers an Orphic uh, sparagmos, towed to pieces by his triumphant enemy. The best tribute is William Faulkner's A Sort of Golgotha of the become in, in immutable in the sonority of its plunging ruin. There's a death for a man now. Shouts out to old William Faulkner from Oxford, Mississippi. Um, a sort of Golgotha of the heart become immutable in the sonority of its plunging ruin. There's a death for a man now. It's plunging ruin. Well, the plunging ruin was also the ruin of Frankenstein. Frankenstein slash the monster, because he's the same, remember? Um, and remember, we talked about the plunging ruin. We talked about the plunging ruin in the interpretation of my interpretation of Titanic, which Natsky liked. Remember that Jack is the Jack is the Satan trickster figure in Titanic, right? Because he lurks, he lives, he lurks in the bowels of the ship. He he talks Rose. Uh, he degrades Rose into this degeneracy, right? They spit from the top, from the from the uh, the top decks, um, and uh, he he def remember how he deflowers Rose, right? And then what happens to, to him at the end? He sinks back into the abyss. Um, former ghost, on a slightly more serious note, uh, why was Rachel, why was Rachel timed out? She said, oh, she said pre-birds. 
why was she timed out? Okay, so anyway, um, <laughs> hold on a second. Okay, so um, former ghost says, I know I shouldn't be looking at the chat. Forgive me for doing that because it gets me off track here. Um, yeah, yeah, bring back Rachel. Um, uh, former ghost says, on a slightly more serious note, I turned 40 a month ago. Yes, that is serious. That is serious. But I know how you feel, former ghost, because I turned 40 um, a year ago. So anyway, let's get to... Let's get to Moby Dick, okay? Let's cover some Moby Dick. Yes, I got, yeah, I think I saw that earlier, Jeff. Yes, I got these at the Jay's Analysis store of um, Sticky Notes. He sells them for, um, he sells them, but only to uh, pay piggies. Pay piggy. So, let's cover some of this. Let's start with the beginning. Where shall we begin? At the beginning. Um, let's see. I guess I'll I'll skip that introduction. So I've already introduced enough. The book's dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne, of course. Um, published in 1851, a year after Hawthorne's uh, The Scarlet Letter. And here we go. The beginning of the book. This book has the possibly the most famous opening sentence of any, certainly of any American novel. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely. Um, having little or no money in my purse and knowing and nothing particular of interest uh, to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and circulating the circulation, regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Then I count it high time to get to get to see as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There's nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree sometime or other cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. I have two friends who um, sort of li literally did that. One was a cr one of those crab fishermen in, in um, Alaska. He was on a crab fishing boat. And another was a fisherman on the eastern, uh, on the, uh, eastern shore. And um, you want to hear a story. All right, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a personal story before we, before we keep going. Um, my friend who was... Um, a fisherman on the Eastern shore, he was, uh, he would, you know, they went out into, into deep water and, you know, he, it's a, it's a dangerous lifestyle. Well, one day his mother, this is a true story. His mother came to visit him and, um, and she drove all the way. She drove two hours to go see him and, and she surprised him. And he said, uh, mom, what are you doing here? And, um, she said, I just wanted to come see you. Um, but I also have a gift for you. And, um, pocket knife. And he said, wow, that's really nice, mom. And she said, yes, well, last night she had it. She had a dream the night before that her son, whom I won't name, um, what, uh, was drowning, that he fell overboard and that he was drowning and he was caught in a fishing line and that he drowned. And so she woke up out of this strong dream and she, she thought if he'd only had a pocket knife to cut the line, he would have lived. And so she went and bought a pocket knife and she drove two hours to go see him. Well, this is absolutely true. That day he went out on the boat and he got caught in a line and it took him overboard. And he was, he told me this, he was going down into the dark water and he said he knew he was going to die. And he, he felt his leg caught in the, in the line. And then he felt a sense of peace and something sparked in him. And he remembered the pocket knife. He pulled it out of his pocket. He cut the line. He went up and he lived. And he said that was the day that he found God. Um, so this, I couldn't help but think of that um, when I was reading this book. And that is sort of 
not really what Ishmael's saying here. Ishmael's saying he's he goes out to sea whenever he has a suicidal tendency. But of course, the book is narrated. Yes, glory to God, certainly. Um, the book is narrated from Ishmael, who is telling the back of the story, right, um, of what has happened to him. Now, notice the uh, foreshadowing in the very beginning of the book, right? He says the thing about November in my soul, whenever I find, I love that phrase, November in my soul, right? You can't, you can't help but think of November rain, right? Um, shout out to GNR, but also um, whenever I find myself pausing before coffin warehouses, coffins, because what is it that saves Ishmael at the end of the book? Ishmael is obviously the survivor. He's the lone survivor. Um, what is it that saves him? It is the coffin. He floats on a coffin. Um, so let's see. Let's skip to that coffin, by the way, was prophesied by, um, I forget the, who, which character prophesied it. You're probably watching this thing and duh, it's, I can't remember who prophesied it, but it, one of the characters, um, prophesied that he would, that he would sink, um, something he would sink in a car. He would die in a coffin on board and he dies. Um, and his, the coffin that he makes for himself is the one that, that, um, allows Ishmael to survive. Okay. On page 153, I'm skipping ahead here to some, to a description of Ahab, but deliriously transferring its idea to the abhorred white whale. He pitted himself all mutilated against it. All the most maddens and torment, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil to crazy Ahab were visibly personified and made practically assailable on Moby Dick. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Now, the reason that I am going to that to that one is because Ahab actually doesn't appear in the novel for a long time. He's at the beginning. Ishmael sees Ahab ashore and leaving his home and leaving his family. Um, but he doesn't really reappear on the ship for a long span of time. The beginning of the, of the story basically is Ishmael is telling us that he's going to tell this story and here's what happened. Then he says he made his way to New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. He basically gets into a boarding house. He meets uh, Queequeg, who is like a New Zealand Maori, um, who's like the best, who's going to be the best uh, harpoonist uh, on the ship. And they are forced to bunk together. And um, Queequeg is a cannibal. And so we get this dichotomy between, you know, in, in characterization between the, the, the savage, right, and the new, the old and the young. Um, and later on, that will... That's not just my interpretation. That's a we we see that when, um, when um, when Ishmael comes out of the water with um, is it with Queequeg and they're they they have their two heads um, on top of one of the whales that they get and one's here one's here and um, Ishmael remarks that they are the two heads of of uh, their two heads represent like the dualism inherent in the in the universe in his interpretation. Um, and then anyway, they're, they're on the ship. They get to know the ship and all this stuff. And then Ahab finally appears way later in the book, um, on page 154, but as in his narrow flowing monomania. So I subtitled the stream monomania because Ahab is, is a monomaniac. He's obsessed with this one thing. Right. And that word kind of like desolation appeared in great Gatsby innumerable times. Well, monomania appears so many, it appears three times in three pages in this section. Um, it says this is much yet Ahab's larger, darker, deeper part remains unhinted, but vast to popularize profundities and all truth is profound. Notice profound profundity means the deep, right? And that the ship is literally floating over the abyss of, of, of their world. Right. It's over the vast abyss of the ocean from which Leviathan rises. And it's over there, the, the metaphysical abyss in their quest. Winding far down from within the very heart of this spiked hotel de Clooney, where we here stand, however grand and wonderful, now quit it and take your way. Yet 
nobler, sadder souls to those vast Roman halls of Thermes, where far beneath the fantastic towers of man's upper earth, his root of grandeur, his whole awful essence sits in bearded state, an antique buried beneath antiques and throned on torsos. So with the broken throne, the great gods mocked that captive king. So like a uh, Karyata did, his... Um, he, he patient sits upholding on his frozen brow the the piled entablatures of his age. Wind ye down there, ye prouder, sadder souls. Question that proud, sad king of family likeness. I he did he did beget ye, ye young exiled royalties, and from your grim sire only will the old state secret come. Now in his heart. Ahab had some glimpse of this, namely, all my means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Yet without power to kill or change or shun the fact, he likewise knew that to mankind he did long dissemble in some sort, did still. But that thing of his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility, not to his will determine it. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in that dissembling that when, that when with ivory leg he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucketer him otherwise than but naturally grieved and that to the quick but the terrible casualty which had overtaken him the report of his undeniable delirium at sea was likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause uh, this is the story of his of his uh, losing his leg right or if or if for any reason thought to be corporeally incapacitated for that yet such a one would seem uh, superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings to the attack but be all this as it may, certain it is that with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him, Ahab had purposely sailed upon the present voyage with the one and only and all-engrossing object of hunting the white whale. Had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? They were bent on profitable cruises, the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint was intent on an audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge. Here then was this gray-headed, ungodly old man chasing with curses a Job's whale around the world, at the head of a crew too, chiefly made up of mongrel renegades and castaways and cannibals, morally enfeebled, but also by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in Starbuck, the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness of stub and the pervading mediocrity and flask. Such a crew so officered seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him to his monomaniac revenge. So also the crew, the crew of the ship stands clearly for the American experience because it's made up of all these different types of people. Right. Um, and yet they're all, what are they doing? They're all going down. They're all going to their death. Ooh. Um, let's see on page 156. Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought or rather vague nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest. And yet so mystical and well nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting in a comprehensible form. So then he goes on to talk about Leviathan and, and the, um, the, metaphysical associations with Leviathan, even going back to the Romans and the Greeks when talking about whales, he does long, this book is encyclopedic in terms of its, um, what is it? Cetology, right? Um, let's see. Uh, here he talks about um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He says, bethink thee of the albatross. Whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations? Not Coleridge first through that spell, but God's great unflattering laureate, nature. So he's talking about the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Remember in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, they're on a ship, they're sailing. That, that poem also begins with um, a, a tale. It's not a, a tale, it's a, it's a poem, but it is a... It's a tale told in verse of a man who was on a ship. The ship was wrecked and there was a man um, and the captain. And basically they, the albatross, the high flying albatross, it was the symbol of grace, right? It was the, the albatross landed on the ship and it was a good omen for the sailors. And it was a sign of grace. And what did they do? 
Well, the captain took out a weapon and killed the albatross. He ruined their trip, ruined their luck, and ruined the symbol of their salvation. And hence, then they go down on a hell journey through um, through ice and snow, just like um, the Dante and Ninth Circle, just like Frankenstein, but also into um, uh, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Um, and eventually um, the captain is forced, you know, the captain wears the alb albatross as a symbol of penance because the albatross is shaped like the cross on his back and he's bearing a cross, right? Um, let's see. Uh, the white, here we go about the Leviathan, the al uh, albino whale. As Abraham bowed before the angels, I bowed myself. The white thing was so white, its wings so wide. And in those forever exiled waters, I lost the miserable warping memories of traditions and of towns. Long I gazed at their prodigy or a plumage. Um, let's see. Oh, that's about the the, the albatross. Um, yea, uh, page 160. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, who's personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. There we go. That's one reason why the white whale is the white whale, right? Because he represents the angel of death, right? The pale rider, right? And behold, a white horse. And on him was a rider whose name was, and his name was death. And hell followed with him, right, Tombstone? Um, let's see. Let's skip to, let's skip to some of the bigger passages. Um, Oh, well, on page 315, again, we get another rhyme of the ancient. These are throughout, but the book is so massive. I'm just trying to pick out specific passages. Uh, page 315, but how now in his zone quest does Ahab touch no land? Does his crew drink air? Surely he will stop for water. Nay, for a long time now, the circus running sun has raced within its fiery ring and needs no sustenance, but what's in himself. So Ahab. In other words, Ahab, what they're saying here, just in terms of the actual narrative, is that um, they go out on the ship and all the other whale whaling ships, all the other uh, ships in the fleet are there for profit, right? Because whaling is the, as it says in the introduction, um, whaling is the economic dynamo that fueled the furious engine of American growth. Um, and um, Melville is on the ship from eight, 1841 Let's see. On, he's on that one, 1841 to 1844. Um, and yeah, so so they're all out there for profit. But Ahab, they discover, is not there for profit at all. He doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about whaling. He doesn't care about... He is there for one reason. It's to hunt the white whale, right? That took his leg. Um, That showed him his... That... that, sh that that showed him his mutability, right? Thank you, Jeff, for um, linking that piece. Um, yeah, there are a couple of, of good articles on this and they stated, obviously, they state some of these, I'm, in, I'm sort of incorporating all these into one thesis, but they show a sort of variety of interpretation dealing with, um, with Moby Dick. Let's see. Um, let's go to... Page 394, some dying men are the most tyrannical and certainly since they will shortly trouble us little forevermore, the poor fellows ought to be indulged. I was talking about Pip here. Um, let's see. Uh, talking about Queequeg and his um, devilish tattoo work. They call him a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Right? He lives on pure will alone, just like Ahab. We were just reading that about Ahab. That Ahab has no sustenance, no food or nor water. He simply lives on his spite and his will. His one Gnostic quest to kill this um, symbol of Demiurge in his worldview, right? Um, let's see. Death on this page 399. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. 
Therefore, to the death longing eyes of such men who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all contributed and all receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plane of unimaginable taking terrors and wonderful new life adventures. And from the hearts of infinite Pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them. In that we get references to Hamlet, um, the, the Iliad or sorry, the Odyssey. Um, come hither broken hearted. Here's another life without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural without dying for them. Come hither, bury thyself in a life, which to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world is more oblivious than death. Come hither, put up thy gravestone too within the churchyard and come hither till we marry thee. Right. In other words, they, their, their body literally sinks into the, to the abyss. Um, let's see, uh, Ahab, um, oh, okay. Listen to this on page 401. So, so Ahab is looking for another, um, harpoon and he says the harpoon that will kill the white whale has not been made yet. And he says, uh, let's see. The blacksmiths start working on a new on a new harpoon. I know it, old man. These stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Ahab tried them one by one by spiraling them with his own hand around a long, heavy iron bolt. When Ahab stayed his hand and said he would weld his own iron, uh, the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, the Parsi passed silently and bowing over his head towards the fire seemed invoking some curse or some blessing on the toil. What's that bunch of Lucifers dodging around there for? Muttered, muttered, muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. That Parsi smells fire like a fusi and smells of it himself like a hot musket's powder pan. Wow, the alliteration in that's amazing. Also, what, what he's saying here is that Ahab is... Ahab is... Um, toiling in the bowels of the ship running the um the furnace making forging his own um harpoon as if he's Hephaestus or Vulcan lurking beneath the volcano of the ship right um Pray God, not that. Yet I fear something, Captain Ahab, is not this harpoon for the white whale, for the white fiend, he says. But now for the barbs, thou must make them myself, man. Here are my razors, the best of steel, here, and make thee barbs sharp as the needle sleet of the icy sea. No, no water for that, cluster of dark nods replied. Yes, three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptiste non baptizo te in nomine patris said in nomine diaboli deliriously howled Ahab as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Uh, this guy is truly satanic, right? He baptizes his, his barbed harpoon steel in the blood of the dead whale, which is the sort of the stand in this whale is the stand in for the actual whale. And the actual whale is a stand in for the demiurge, right? And he's baptizing it in the name of Satan here. He says, uh, it says, this done pale iron, uh, pole iron and rope, like the three fates, like the three weird sisters in Macbeth, right? Remained inseparable. And Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon, the sound of his ivory leg. Notice how he's lame, like Hephaestus, like Vulcan. Right, he's literally lame, like Vulcan, the lightning rod forger, who forged lightning for Zeus. Of course, Hephaestus at least is married to, um, to Aphrodite, and who is, who is uh, Ahab has a wife back at home, but he's actually he's actually wed to the sea, or he's wed to his singular hatred for this beast. Um, let's see, let's get to, let's get to some actual, um, soliloquies from Ahab. 
Here we go with King Lear on page 406. How wondrous familiar is a fool, muttered Ahab. Then aloud, thou art a full ship and homeward bound, thou sayest. Well, then call me an empty ship and outward bound. So go thy ways and I will mine. Forward there, set all sail and keep her to the wind. And Ahab, leaning over the, the taffrail, eyed the homeward bound craft. He took from his pocket a small vial of sand and then looking from the ship to the vial seemed thereby bringing two remote associations together for that vial was with Nantucket soundings, right? So in this part, a ship sails up on side and says, where are you going, man? Right? And he's like, he's like, I don't know where you're going, but you're, you're going home back to Nantucket. We're staying out here. And he pulls out a vial of Nantucket sand and pours it, right? And he's, this is a unification of the opposites. Yes, because he's trying to unify these two opposites into his singular monomania. Page 407, for that strange spectacle observable in all sperm whales dying, the turning sunwards of the head and so expiring, that strange spectacle beheld of such placid evening, somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns. Turns him to it. How slowly. This is the, on the death of the whale itself. Fastly, his homage rendering an invoking brow with his last dying motions. He too worships fire. Most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun. Oh, that these two favoring eyes should see those two favoring sights. Look here, far waterlocked, beyond all human weal or woe. In these most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages the billows have still rolled on speechless and unspoken to as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source. Here, too, life dies sunwards full of faith, but see no sooner dead than death whirls round the corpse and it heads some other way. So he's talking about how he's talking about how he respects the whale, but how how he when the whale perishes, when they kill a whale, the whale turns and then falls into the abyss, right? Yet dost thou darker half rock me with a prouder, if a darker faith. All thy unnameable minglings float beneath me here. I am buoyed by breaths of once living things. Exhaled is air, but water now. You see how he is the Satan figure, right? And he wants to he thinks that essentially Ahab thinks that he is liberating himself in total freedom, right? Freedom. Oh, just spilled my Red Bull on that on the book. Uh, that's embarrassing. Um, now uh, he thinks that he is liberating himself because he's in total control over his ship, over men, over over creation, and he wants to have total control over this over this beast, but he also re respects the power of the beast, but he himself really is the beast, isn't he? He is the Leviathan itself. Um, and really it's his unification of death that through which he thinks he will transcend. Um, but he will, uh, he himself will fall into the abyss because he's a Satan figure. He thinks he thinks, so Captain Ahab thinks that he, on his Gnostic quest, right, will try to, he that he will transcend the bounds of his, like, false reality by hunting this creature that is an avatar for the Demiurge, right? But we can see that he is actually the Satan figure in this. Everything that he does throughout the book uh, reeks of a Miltonian Satanism, the way that he blasphemes, the way that he forges the, the harpoon, the way that he curses his men, the way that he's on this monomaniacal singular mission. Um, let's see. It says, let's look at page 410. It says, where's Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is even now beholding him. I, and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown thither side of thee, thou son. Then gazing at his quadrant and handling one after the other, its numerous Kabbalistical contrivances. He pondered again and muttered, foolish toy, baby's plaything of haughty admirals. 
as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Remember, it talk, remember even Bloom in the um, in the introduction talked about the the illuminating Kabbalistic a, um, uh, aspects and ambiance of this novel. And as the ship half wheeled upon her heel, her three firm seated graceful mass erectly poised upon her long ribboned hull seemed as the three Horatii pirouetting on one sufficient steed. Old man of oceans, of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain but one little heap of ashes? That reminds me of the Great Gatsby stream that we just did, right? With the Valley of Ashes, the Wasteland. the way. Now, of course, this takes place, this is a 19th century book, but Melville wrote it. it, it there is a prophetic air to this book in terms of the the idea of the infancy of America. Remember, the ship stands for the variety of Americanism. And right here, he's sort of prophesying the heap of ashes of modernity. That's why Ishmael at the beginning says, whenever anything gets too rough on land, whenever the cities get too crowded, instead of the ball and the gun, instead of SUI side, what does he do? He goes out onto the ocean. Um, let's see. On page 415, I own thy speechless, placeless power. Said I not so? Nor was it wrung from me, nor do I now drop these links. Thou canst bind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ash. This is, uh, this is Ahab's soliloquy, right? On the deck of the ship, he's actually talking, he's actually talking to the whale, but this is like a this is almost a full fathom five Prospero esque soliloquy, right? Um, on the uh, on the verge of a tempest, right? right? In the Shakespearean tempest, the lightning flashes through my skull. Mine eyeballs ache and ache. The lightning flashes through his skull because we just said that he is the Hephaestus. He is the remember Ahab with his peg leg. He is the Hephaestus um, Vulcan under the volcano um, creature that lurks on board this ship. Mine eyeballs ache and ache. My eyeballs ache and ache. That reminds me of, that's straight from Macbeth. Remember um, Macbeth's uh, vision after he, uh, after the witch's Sabbath, right? When he consumes the, the, um, the witch's brew and he sees the vision of Banquo and the line, will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? And he says that crown does sear mine eyeballs. Right, the illumination, the illumin the actual true illumination of truth burns him. Light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness, but I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. So there we go with the with the unification of Ahab as the white whale itself, right? He is the white whale. Um I read my sire, leap, leap up and lick the sky. I leap with thee, burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee, defying, defyingly, I worship thee. All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine and heart, soul and body, lungs and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats. Look ye here, thus I blow out the last fear. And with one blast of his breath, he extinguished the flame. So at those last words of Ahab's, many of the mariners did run from him in a terror of dismay. Okay, let's get to the final, um, the final chapters of the book. And um, like at the end of chapter 124, in the fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab and all his fatal pride. There he is. There's the, Minto there's the Miltonian Satan, right? He's lounged on the shores of the lake of fire in pandemonium, right? Uh, fallen with fallen from his pride. It says, let's see on page, page 432. So far gone am I in the dark side of earth that its other side, the theoretic bright one seems but uncertain twilight to me. Some unknown conduits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. Uh, let's see. Let's see. On okay, here we go. At page 130. I'm sorry, page 437, chapter 130. Um, this is the hat. Uh, in this chapter, this is where 
<laughs> they're they're on the ship and kind of like in Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the albatross swoops down and takes the and and swoops down on the ship and then they kill the albatross. In this scene, a bird swoops down and steals um Ahab. And this is um this is a powerful omen. And it says, uh, see, the mortar of Ahab's iron soul, ever conscious that the old man's desperate eye was on them. He watches over them with an all-seeing eye on the ship. Or else a tremulous shadow cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body. And that shadow was always hovering there. So so here we get, again, this, this idea of mirrors, right? The idea of mirrors and the psyche and, and the splitting and the unification of opposites. So we have... We have the uh, we have the submarine world, right? And we've got the surface world. We've got the subtext and the text. We've got the figure, figurative and the literal. And just as the white whale is assumed to be always watching them when they're on the ship, they never know when it's going to appear. Ahab watches them on the surface aboard, right? And they look down. Uh, he looks down, and there's always an all-seeing eyes seeing everything that they do, just as. Ahab is obsessed with the idea of the demiurge and this sort of false reality that he's in. And he wants to destroy, he wants to destroy it. He wants to destroy his origins. He is angry at his concept of God. He sees himself as a um, satanic, as this is a purely a, again, a Miltonian Satan, right? Uh, making a, uh, a heaven of his hell. Um, it says, let's see, on page 438, um, though such a potent spell seems secretly to join the twain. Also, I forgot the idea. Um, I forgot the image of um, Ahab also is scan. He's always scanning the horizon and he's always cursing the sun. But remember that he's on, that they're on water. And so the water is another mirror. Right. This is kind of an as above, so below concept. I know I'm stretching a little bit here, but I think it's borne out. I think it's borne out um, by the text. We're constantly seeing these images and and references to monomania, to um, opposites, to infusion. Um, let's see. Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles ahead, astern, this side and that. Within the wide expanded circle commandeered at so great a height. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes and the long hooked brill at his head, a bill at his head with a scream. The black hawk darted away with his prize. An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it. And thereupon Tanaquil, his wife, declared that the Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good, and Ahab's hat was never restored. A minute black spot was dimly discerned, falling from that vast height into the sea. Um, chapter 131, the harpoon is not yet forged that uh, ever will do that, right? Tanned in blood and tempered by lightning are these barbs. I swear to temper them triply in that hot place behind the fin where the white whale most feels his accursed life. Triply, right? This is like the, this is like the, the, the weird sisters of Macbeth, right? Hecate's triple goddess, which is a, a Hamlet. Remember in, in the play within a play in the mousetrap, right? Ha, um, in Hamlet, right? The triple goddess. Um, and how in Macbeth, every, everything comes in threes. Then God keep the old man. It's, it's obviously an inversion of the Trinity here, right? Um, he says, but suddenly started Pequod, um, was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea. Not so quick indeed was that some of the flying bubbles might have sprinkled her hull with the ghostly baptism. In vain, O ye strangers, ye fly our sad burial, ye but turn us, you're to frail to show us your coffin. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, what was it? What nameless, inscrutable, earthly thing it is, is it? What cozening, hidden lord and master, cruel and remorseless emperor commands me? This is page 444, chapter 132. 
that against all natural lovings and longings, I so keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can resolve, but by some invisible power. That reminds me of, um, there's a scene in Julius Caesar where um, where uh, they confront Caesar at the Senate in Act 1. And um, who is it that confronts him? Um, it's not Brutus, not Cassius. It's uh, Casca. I think it's Casca uh, confronts Caesar at the Senate. And he basically said, um, listen, um, can you please sign this warrant that will allow my brother to come back from exile? And Caesar says, no, I'm not going to do that. And Casca says, come on, man, please do it. And we know, right, the dramatic irony is that we know that this is going to give him, this is going to give Casca just one one final nail in the coffin that's going to allow them to push their conspiracy into action. Because immediately after this um, is when um, Brutus confronts Caesar and he says, doth Brutus bootless kneel? But when Casca says that to him, um, Caesar says, but I am constant is the northern star of whose true fixed and resting quality is the firmament. So in the world, which is essentially to say he's made a decision. He's never going to he's never going to back down from it. He's never going to change it because Caesar's will is like a third person immovable. And so, of course, that gives them reason to to assassinate him. That's that's their thing. They say he's a tyrant. But this sort of that is a counterpoint in the rest of the play to how um, the fault dear Brutus is not um, in the stars, but in ourselves, right? Get this idea that Ahab is immovable, right? Nothing is going to shake him from his fell purpose as Macbeth, as Shakespeare says in Macbeth. Um, He says, let's see. uh, Moby Dick finally appears. Um, and he is truly, they, they basically describe him as truly the Leviathan, the Leviathan of Job, right. Or the, or the Leviathan of, of revelation. And eventually notice that, you know, that Ahab in the final scene is in the final scene of the novel is going to appear strapped to Leviathan, but almost riding him. Right. He's almost like, um, he's almost like, uh, the antichrist riding Leviathan, uh, rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm well thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of air and piling up a mountain of dazzling foam shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In those moments, the torn and raged waves he shakes off seems seem his mane. In some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance, right? He is, this is the Leviathan um, r- arising from the abyss. Um, not the white whale, page 458, nor man nor fiend can so much as graze old Ahab in his own proper and inaccessible being. Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole act's immutably decreed. T'was rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled. Fool, I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. In other words, he is, he is the Satan figure. He is tied to Leviathan, right? Uh, Rachel said, as BL said, whether he has written anything, he must have written. Yes, I have. I have written. I, I, I don't want to say I'm a writer, but yeah, that's, um, I wrote, um, I've written three books of poems. Um, and one of them was my, my thesis in university. And that was read by, let's see, the guy who read it, the guy who read it, uh, meaning he, approved of my thesis was Pulitzer Prize winner. I'm not bragging here, folks, but was Pulitzer Prize winner Paul Muldoon. I love that his book is called Horse Latitudes, right? I think I've quoted this before. This Horse Latitudes, that's, it's also the name of, it's a real thing, but that's the name of Jim Morrison's song, right? Uh, Awkward incident. The first animal is Jettison. Pure plagues, furiously pumping the stiff green gallop and heads bob up, poised, delicate, a mute nostril agony, carefully confined and sealed over. Um, 
But yeah, I, I know that because it's supposed to be anonymous, but I know that because I went to a reading um, when I came back to America, I went to a reading and Paul, uh, of Paul Muldoon reading. And when I met him after the reading, um, I told, you know, I shook hands and told him my name and he remembered my book. So um, yeah, I've written three books of poems and I am, um, I've been working on a novel um, for a little while now. I started it when La Quarantinqua first happened. Um, I'll tell you the title. It's called Monarch. And I talked about this uh, before in one of the streams a little bit um, where it's sort of based on um, Kathy O'Brien and their, and their, not that I totally believe Kathy O'Brien, but what that about MK Ultra and Monarch. Um, so it's, it's about that. Um, and it has a, it's like a, I don't know. It's like, it's not a horror or a slasher or something, but the villain, one of the characters um, kills with a mirror shard in the book. He's an MK ultra victim and he kills with a mirror shard uh, just like in red dragon. Um, but anyway, that sounds pretty, that sounds, that probably sounds lame, but um, I, I don't know. I'm I think it'll be good. So anyway, um, let's see, let's get back to this and let's um, let's finish up here. A uh, monomaniac Ahab. Ahab stands alone among the millions of the people of earth, nor gods, nor men, his neighbors. Uh, let's see. Page 450. What a lovely day again. That's from, you remember from Mad Max Fury Road? What a lovely day. What a lovely day again. Here's food for thought. Had Ahab time to think, but Ahab never thinks. He only feels, feels, feels. That's tingling enough for mortal men to think's audacity, God only has that right and privilege. I've sometimes thought my brain was very calm, frozen calm. This old skull cracks so like a glass in which the contents turn to ice and shiver it. Well, there we go with mirror images and, and the, the fracturing of the psyche. Um, were I the wind, I'd blow no more of such a wicked, miserable world. I'd crawl somewhere to a cave and slink there. And yet... Tis a noble and heroic thing to win. Even Ahab is a braver thing, a nobler thing than that. I misdoubt me that I disobey my God in obeying him, Ahab says. Um, forehead to forehead, I meet thee the third time, Moby Dick. So they meet the third time. <laughs> my impression. They meet the third time, and this is the point of their of their... This is his fatal vision. Some men die at ebb tide, some at low water, some at the full of the of the flood. Flood. Obviously, obviously, we get flood images here. We get the deluge, the deluge, right? Um, where the ship is sort of an anti ark, sort of an anti Noah's ark. It's inverted. Um, drive, drive in your nails, O ye waves. To their utmost heads, drive them in. Is this supposed to be a, a, a blasphemous Christ image from Golgotha? Like, remember, um, Harold Bloom said at the beginning. See, he, see, Ahab takes it like this is this is his cross to bear. But of course, this is the not this is the anti cross, right? Because he is there purely through feeling, emotion, maniacal, monomaniacal drive and will, right? He is the Satan figure hammering away at God's creation. Um, retribution, swift vengeance, eternal malice were in his whole aspect. And in spite of all that mortal man could do, the solid white buttress of his forehead smote the ship's starboard bow till the men in timbers reeled. The, of course, we know that the whale destroys the ship. And eventually he is, let's see, um, he is taken and Ahab falls into the abyss. And then finally we get the epilogue. Let's see. Um, no small fowl flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf. The yawning gulf is a Shakespearean image. The yawning gulf also refers to the yawning grave, right? The, the hell mouth. A sullen white surf beat against its steep uh, sides. Then all collapsed and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. The epilogue, of course, is from Job, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And eventually, um, uh, Ishmael survives. He's the lone survivor, and he makes his way back to where he tells his story, right? 
Yes, Picard was Ahab in that TV production. Yeah, I've actually seen that one. Um, I watched it because, uh, no, I'm not bragging here, folks, but Patrick Stewart, remember, he almost ran over me at school. He went to my drama school. He came back for a speech. So that's why I watched that one. If you guys, though, haven't seen the classic Moby Dick with uh, Gregory Peck, right, um, you should watch it. It's 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 close to the novel. It's actually really good. It's, it's you know, it's color. and um, And I like it because it's filmed in Cove in Ireland. C-O-B-H. Um, they filmed it offshore um, in Ireland. And um, it's that's why I like it. But it's it's actually pretty close to the book. Yeah, Natsuki, I totally, I, I hear you. I never understood all the fuss about this book, but now it all makes sense. Well, I mean, I'm the same way. You know, I, I said at the beginning, like, you know, I, 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 I have purposefully avoided this book for many years because like we said with some of the other works, it insists upon itself, right? It's so deeply ingrained in the con- in the culture, in the American consciousness, in the Emersonian transcendental self-reliance of like the American experience that I, I was like, look, you know, enough. And I was, and I avoided it. Um, of course I, I knew the book well and I, you know, and I studied it in, in, in AP and then in grad school and, 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 and all that stuff. But I never sat down to just read the book for fun until two years ago, um, and and I didn't regret it. Um, and like uh, Harold Bloom says, you know, it is certainly a work. It is a Shakespearean prose poem. Um, it is huge. It's huge in every way. It's like you can write endless criticism uh, of this book, and and you can explicate the book for any number of themes. A lot, you know, we went over a few of them here, but I think that the most appropriate is certainly the Gnostic Luciferian quest theme and the idea of Ahab as both a Satan figure in this sort of cosmic bubble Plato world of the ocean in which the book takes also the, the sort of the experience of mankind um, and how it plays out on the ship um, as a microcosm, as a micro, as a sort of a universal microcosm. Now, that's not to say that I agree with those, obviously. I mean, I agree that those are appropriate interpretations of the novel, but you all know this, you're high IQ. I don't agree with those as, a, as worldviews, um, but I certainly see them as the most appropriate in terms of the analysis of the purpose and the meaning of the book and what um, the speaker in this book, and it's it's interesting that a lot many critics have pointed out that it is it's dangerous to conflate Ishmael with Melville. And like we've said at the very beginning of this channel, one of the uh, part of my mo in this was to make sure that every work we read that we're judging the text uh, on its own merit and for itself, rather than conflating the speaker for the writer. That's the reason we started off with Macbeth because we so we know so little of Shakespeare and we want to judge the text by itself. Of course, it's always important to look at the um, at the overarching themes and and the co- and context in which it was written. Um, so shout out to everybody who's here. Oh, shout out to DPH. Shout out to Kotel, our homie David Patrick Harry. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you so much. Um, great interview with. Our homeboy Jerry last night, really appreciate that. That was awesome. Um, everybody enjoyed that, and we always get a lot out of that. And of course, you know, we're all, of course, we're all big fans here. Look, folks, I'm not going to brag or anything, but we're all big fans of uh, DPH. So, yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, everybody. Really appreciate you. Thank you for uh, Jeff and Natsuki and all my homeboys and homegirls for uh, holding it down. Thank you to Base Homeschool Mom. Shout out to um, a devotional heart, Allison. Um, Cheers for the shirt. She made me the shirt. Yeah. So shout out to, right? 1607. Shout out to VA. Shout out to Appalachistan. Shout out to all of our friends and homies out there all over the world. <laughs> so again, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all being here for this um, analysis of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Um, and of course, again, we went over Harold Bloom's Genius and look at the articles that I linked. They played a part in um, some of my uh, explication here. Um, Shout out to Mowgli, to um, Eliana, 
to Rat Tail. Shout out to Rat Tail, all my friends uh, out there. And I hope everybody's doing well. I hope we have a good week. I'm sure we will have a wonderful week this week. Um, again, if you see the links um, in the chat that my homeboys and homegirls have been dropping throughout, really appreciate your support. They're also in the video description. Let me look. Let me um, check and see if anybody see. Oh, look at that. Somebody hit me up with a donation. Wow. Oh, thank you. Wow. Thank you, sir. Thank you to Kotel. Really appreciate you who donates $10. Thank you so much for your support, sir. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Wow. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me, of course. Um, and uh, I really appreciate it. We're going to get, um, we're going to get Streamlabs donations going here one day, right? So that we can um, get some super chats in here. And of course we're almost at 200 subs. So guys, we've made it a pretty long way. I mean, we've been going for two months and we've already got 200 subs and, um, you know, we get a pretty good audience. Of course I get you guys every time. You're the best audience that I could ever ask for, but we get, um, a pretty good, uh, size audience, especially watching streams later. So I really appreciate that. And you guys don't forget before we go, um, uh, please, um, smash that like and leave a comment for me in the, um, below the video when it's over. Uh, cause as we know, it helps me with the algorithm. And even if you leave, um, crispy style, <laughs> crispy style, um, comments, right. Which are nice one or cheers. Those are good enough. Those help you. So thank you guys. Really appreciate it. I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Um, we, there's a couple streams coming up later. Um, Tristana will be streaming a little bit later. And then of course I'll see you guys in, uh, JD Hizzy for late, um, later on tonight around nine 30 Eastern Eastern time. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Love you all, and I will see you later. Peace out. Peace.